Um, so welcome to the presentation on the Baxter Andrews uh, collection from Cape Island, Newfoundland. Uh, from what I've uh, gained from uh, Bernice via telephone calls and now finally meeting her, uh, Baxter and uh, Bernice would walk the beach of Cape Island from 1953, right? and collect arrowheads along their journeys. And uh, it's something kind of near and dear to me because the way I got into archaeology was what we call beach combing. It's when you just walk the beach and just collect all these things. I never got this lucky. I never got one arrowhead. It was always like um, sea glass or like a broken plate of some sort at a beach. But uh, I'm originally from uh, New England, specifically uh, Rhode Island, and I got into archaeology because of beachcombing, and I, uh, I admire, I admire the connection between the project and uh, how I got into archaeology myself. And um, so, I'll just get into it here. But uh, yeah, no, I'm a master's student at uh, Memorial University of Newfoundland, and soon to be hopefully a PhD candidate this fall at Memorial as well. So let me just get into it. So the contents of the presentation are pretty simple. Uh, they consist of the people, such as the Bay Alphic, including Sean Uh The artifacts themselves, uh, both of them on the side there, the preforms of the little passage, recent Indian. And also a, a small little uh, part about landscape, uh, including landscapes that the Bay Alphic would have seen and been in. So what is the community collections Archaeological Research Project? It's a great question. But first off, this picture represents the entirety of the Andrews Collection, which is actually at this moment located in the back there for afterwards, so you can actually see them for yourselves. But going back to it, what is CCAR, as we like to call it? And uh, it's a project that engages uh, private collectors with their archaeological collection. It builds a trusting relationship between private collectors and the archaeologists, be it academic or government or whatever. It facilitates public education. Uh, it promotes awareness of archaeological resources in the area. It promotes community awareness uh, in heritage and archaeology. And it facilitates student training in archaeology, like myself. It documents these private collections, like this has been done. And it makes available uh, private collections for public education in scientific, uh, scientific investigations and archaeological investigations. The peopling of Newfoundland. The term peopling is used when a geographical landscape, such as the island of Newfoundland, uh, is previously, previously uninhabited, and then it has a movement of people onto the land. Um, and essentially, Newfoundland, for those who don't know, uh, there was a giant glacier that covered the mainland thousands of years ago. But Newfoundland's got kind of this like, oddity, had an uh, independent ice cap on top of it. And when the ice cap receded and melted, Newfoundland rose, which is called isostatic rebound. Um, this is interesting because Newfoundland's constantly rising and the rest of the land to Canada is kind of eroding or sinking because of the sea levels. So it makes Newfoundland geologically unique. But um, as you can see, various peoples and various cultures uh, did arrive to Newfoundland. And this is separated between the Amerindian or uh, First Nations ancestry from on the uh, right and on the left is the Paleo Eskimo, and these are two separate entities. Now, the oldest being uh, the maritime archaic tradition from 8,000 to 3,200 years ago. Uh, the Drosswater then come in afterwards from 2,800 to 1,900 years ago. The Dorset Paleo Eskimo are 2,000 to 1,200 years ago. And while the Dorset Eskimo are here, uh, the climate's changing a little bit, so this, uh, this group of people called the Cowhead Complex is what we've been calling them comes in around 2,000 to 1,050 years ago. And then we have the recent Indian block up there, including the Bayothics, from 1,900 years ago to contact, and then sadly, at the cultural ex uh, extinction of the Bayothics in 1829. Um, and all of those labeled in red are represented within this collection, which is phenomenal. Uh, the amount of time periods represented in one collection like this with such a minute amount of actual artifacts incredible for the province. 
So to start off, I'd like to discuss the age of technology. And one of the things is, is atelial technology. And as you can see, this person has a little thing at the end there. It's like an extended arm. That's the actual atelial. And the spear point or dart with the shaft and the dark point at the end here. These points I'm going to be talking about in a little bit are all representative of that. So, the maritime archaic Indians were the first people to inhabit the island, but weren't restricted to Newfoundland and Labrador alone. Actually, the farthest south we found evidence for these people is in the state of New Jersey. So all the way south of New Jersey, all the way up to Labrador. That's quite an expanse for a certain uh, group of people. And these people have left quite a trace in the province and in North America. Uh, one example is the Lonson Moor uh, burial in Labrador. And it is the oldest uh, burial monument in North America at 7,500 years ago. And it's a single person that was buried there. This is recovered by uh, Dr. Jim Tuck. Uh, and also below that, we have their housing, which is actually found from evidence in Labrador. And if you see the rock bases there, let me point out the little laser pointer here, those little rock bases, those are actually still evident in Labrador. So the term maritime archaic uh, characterizes these coastal aspects, but also respects their hunting interiorly. So what, they're, what food and what animals they're going for in the interior. And this isn't the only tools that they would have. They have slate bayonets. They would have nice, full, grooved, uh, gouges for the woodworking, such as with the housings and all the other uh, things they'd be doing. And then plummets and sinkers are also another famous uh, technology they have in the photos that you always see of these people. But the, but the presence of uh, the maritime archaic ship points, uh, especially the spear points in the Andrews collections, are representative of a southern style, separate from the ones you find in Labrador. Uh, and these are side notched, which means that they are notched like a C or a backward C. Right? And then the expanding stem, kind of like a uh, bird's tail, the way it just kind of expands out that way. And recently a student has identified these specifically as being a Bonavista uh, form, or a Bonavista style. And it's great because this fits right in with the geography of where these were found. As, as in Bonavista Bay? Or? As in Bonavista Bay, okay. yep. So, going on, time-wise. Uh, we have the Dorset Paleo Eskimo, which are represented in the Andrews collection. And these people, again, are after the Dorset, uh, these Dorset Paleo Eskimo are after the Grosswater Paleo Eskimo. Um, and both were, had the main staple of seal within their diet. Um, although the Grosswater and the Dorset both were for seal, they have two different technologies, and it is yet to be found that they are actually genetically related. We don't know if they're actually the same people or if they're just two different people at the, near the same time. But Dorset tools um, included uh, tip fluted uh, harpoon end blades. So that little end blade right there, the uh, lithic part, the rock part there, and then the harpoon, which would be there, and that's how they get the seal. And uh, I originally thought that the Andrews collection piece was an end blade, but it come that it is actually it seems to be something of a perforator and all. It's used to punch holes. And these holes would have been used possibly to, uh, for housing, for clothing. If you look at this picture up here, it is a great example of how much seal is used in, in their daily life. For, for their housing, clothing, like I said. And there's a, over 150 of these houses at Phillips Garden in Port Schwab. And it's, it's mind-blowing their presence here on the island. So, going on. The least understood cow head complex recent Indian. You don't mind the noise. Um, they, yeah, they're the earliest ones to show up for the recent Indian, as far as we can tell. And uh, pictured here up in the right hand corner is the 1970s excavation with the group uh, Jim Tuff, Marcy Madden, Priscilla Renouf, Tip Evans, and Gerald Penny. And this is at the cow head site where it was found. Uh, Stephen Hull, who's now the PAO of the province, or the Provincial Archaeological Office, uh, in his master's thesis, he says that the cow head complex is related to a complex known as the Flich littoral complex, located in Blanc-Seblon, uh, Quebec. 
So right across the way um, on the mainland. And when these people cross, they, they seem to scout out a certain lithic source or a certain rock source to use their, their points out of. And it's Cowhead Chert, which is located on the southwestern portion of the Great Northern Peninsula. And lo and behold, a cowhead point made of cowhead shirt. It's right within the whole collection there. So it's really nice to see that something that we don't know much about, we can add one point to. And now, the beach is complex. Uh, it's regarded as the ancestral uh, peoples of the Little Passage, which then become the Bay Othic, as we know historically. Now, the lithic assemblage of the beaches complex includes uh, scrapers, triangular bifaces, linear blades, and again, side knot points. And as you can see, mm -hmm. when I said earlier, these, the C and the backward C, you can see that C. And you can look at the other ones and then you can see the side knot in there. Pretty evident. And uh, they had other complexes that were related to this in other parts of the air of the province specifically. Uh, such complexes known as Point Revenge and uh, Daniel Rattle. Uh, in Labrador and lower, um, the lower North Shore of Quebec. And these, common, these share common attributes associated with the beaches complex. Um, and the thing is, it's funny about the beaches, is that they are appearing as the Dorset Paleo Eskimo are disappearing, which talks about the climatic change, how the, how the environment is changing from cold and subarctic, where you can find seals, to getting a little bit warmer. This may talk a little bit more about <coughs> what kind of food they were getting and what kind of food was available. <coughs> and uh, again, this point is made of what we call cowhead shirt. So it's interesting that we have a point of reference of what rocks they're getting when they're coming into the province, especially the island of Newfoundland. And now, at this point within the history of, of the pre-contact uh, complexes in, in Newfoundland, we have a kind of a bit of a quandary of, is there bow and arrow technology and when does it come in? The question, the answer is, there is bow and arrow technology when the Bayoptic are here, but when is that introduced? And I think the conclusion has come to that there is both an atlatl presence and a bow and arrow technology within this next time frame, so we're not exactly sure where uh, the bow and arrow definitely comes in. But going into the little passage complex, uh, they are the cultural descendants of the beaches complex, and they are self-identified uh, to the Europeans as the day off it when the Europeans come to the island. Excuse me, where is Little Passage? Where is Little Passage? Yeah. Not really sure. Geographically. Um, the Little uh, Passage complex lithic uh, assemblages include linear blades, uh, thumbnail scrapers, small triangular bifaces, it, but distinctively they have these small corner notch points, and you can see the C has moved down towards a corner, mm -hmm. right? So they have a different blueprint of what points to make. But uh, this may actually be in result of the climate changing even more from the Dorset and the beaches to even you know, more of a diversity, more diverse environment for them to hunt and get subsistence and food and for their diet. And it's interesting that uh, the transition between the beaches and the little passage complexes are present from the side notch to the corner notch, and the transition between the two is kind of rare. And here's one from the Andrews Collection. Uh, corner notched, much larger than its other little passage points, but fits well within the transition <coughs> between the two. Is it also chert? Yes, it is chert. Um, now, the question is, is that, is this part of the dart to arrow technology transition, or was it present for the atlatl? We're not entirely sure. More evidence needs to be brought up. But, uh, the diagnostic little passage slash bay off it projectile points uh, are what we call the CNES, or the corner notch expanding stem. A lot of words for something very basic. It's essentially that, that little point right there, the base has that expanding stem that looks like a little bird's tail again, but the, but the way that they notch it, it would be hafted or put onto the shaft, the wooden shaft, is cornered right there. So that's corner notch expanding stem. The Bay Optic, as you'll see in a second, is a corner notch straight stem, and it's a, it's a tad different. But these stylizations can actually kind of give a difference between the little passage and the Bay Optic, and it's kind of like that simple. 
I didn't snap. That's in there. <laughs> so the Beothic again, their descendants of the little past people, and uh, they become the Beothic when they're, they say that they are the Beothic when the Europeans come. And they, the technology I said was similar. And here's the point in the Andrews collection that shows it. It has a straight stem. See how it doesn't have that bird's tail kind of shape? Yeah. That's pretty representative of, of the Beothic points. And the funny thing was, when the Europeans arrived, the Beothics were really interested in the metals that the Europeans had. But because of the seasonal fishing and the lack of an actual um, stable settlement in the uh, province, you know, the Europeans would come, they'd fish, and then they'd go back home. But when they went back home, the Beothic would go, oh, okay, opportunity. All right, we'll take the metals then. So when they, they took these metals, they never actually traded, right? They never actually had interactions with the Europeans, so they got to be able to keep their traditional ways. And this is kind of a, like, I do more work in Nova Scotia with the, with the Mi'kmaq, and the Mi'kmaq would actually have uh, trading spots and they'd wait for the Europeans. The Beothic just took and modified. And it's evident with this harpoon end blade right there, made of iron. And then these uh, nails that are modified in the bottom here. Really interesting stuff. So, yeah, and then the Beothic, sadly, uh, historically as we know it, became extinct in 1829 with uh, Shauna Diffic, uh, excuse me, being the last Beothic known. Uh, culturally extinct, but not possibly genetic, we're not sure. So, and then there's always that section of uh, artifacts dedicated to the head scratchers. What is it? Uh, the three points here three-point tips are just point tips. We don't know what they are because we don't know the base of the point. The base of the point would be more of an attribute to tell us what they were, what are they. But all we can say is that there are three additional points that were found. And one of them is cowhead shirt, which is great. goes with the narrative of this cowhead shirt coming in. And this one was the definite head scratcher. Um, it looks like a, a rock that kind of looks like a pickle. Um, <laughs> At first I was like, what is this? And I thought maybe it was for using against the other rocks to actually nap, to make the, st uh, the points. And then I was told recently that it looks like a plummet, but the top of the plummet is gone. So it would have been a plummet for just weighing down some string into the water. But I'm not, I'm not too keen. We don't have a defined answer for that. So. But the analysis of the artifacts, with the, what I did with the analysis here in the report that you have, uh, what I did was I basically looked at the common attributes of these points. Simple stuff. Height, width of the point, thickness of the point, the notch height of the point, which actually gives you quite an interesting um, idea of what they're doing with the hafting or putting out the shaft. And then the basal width, which also helps with the whole understanding of the shaft um, connection there. And the analysis of the artifacts was uh, compared to like hundreds and hundreds of points uh, within the province, especially when it came to the Little Passage uh, and the Bay Offit, although they are connected to the Little Passage and the Bay Offit are connected. The beaches had about 80 samples, I believe, uh, 80 plus samples compared to. This is the kicker. The transitional point here in the corner is one of three in the province. It's that important. One of three. So that so this just created a baseline for anybody else to find points like. It. It's really neat. And these points <laughs> specifically can be just identified, I think more so just by visual than by the measurements themselves when uh, identifying. So like I said, the side notch in that C, you can see it here in the in the beaches. So that would be a side notch straight style. And yes, we do the stylus by what they look like. And you have, again, the corner notch expanding stem versus the corner notch straight stem. And you can see the clear difference between the two. And also the material as well. One is a shirt. This one over here is a shirt. And this one over here looks like a uh, chalcedony of some sort. We have yet to understand exactly where that source would be. Where is the, uh, this one not called Rhyolite? Rhyolite. Yeah. The rhyolite was more so for the maritime archaic. That, that was present in this collection, because that two were made of rhyolite material. 
Where would the rye light have come from? Like? Ooh, good question. Where would the rye light have come from? It would have probably been more so from, you have Bloody Bay Cove, yeah. Yeah. Bloody Bay Rye Light there. Um, that's probably, I think that's probably the, the big one for me that I can think of off the top of my head, personally. But there's a bunch of other sources. So it was the Martin Marquette that used the Rye Light. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I didn't use the Rye Light. As far as, as, from what I saw in the collections, is more so Chert. They could have used Rye Light, but more so Chert. Yeah. Um, so going on to uh, landscape, uh, what is the landscape? And, and, and the landscape is really the plot of a storyline. It always is. You know, you look at the story and it's like, where is the setting? Right? It's the landscape is that setting. And it's another piece of the evidence to help out the investigation of why the projectile points are in this place. Like, why are they here in Cape Island? And there's geographical attributes or aspects uh, that are similar um, to on yeah so such geographical attributes are found similar to the projectile points being found and how do we connect these pieces together and one way of looking at this is through a fancy term known as landscape ethnoecology what does that mean well what that means is basically that landscape ethnoecology is looking at the perspective of the land through the people who lived it, or attempting to look at the landscape as the people would have perceived it, how they would have been connected to it, right? So this even includes uh, time, space, biological things such as bugs, animals, whales, their connection to the environment, and where they were placed in it. And due to the uh, positioning of Cape Island, uh, it would be my estimate that it was either a vantage point for looking for food or other people because of its placement in the bay and where it is. It just seems like quite a place to be uh, camping out for a second and have, having a little bit of a stop. And this is actually evident in the uh, historical record, especially by an anthropologist known as Frank Speck. Now, Frank Speck came to Newfoundland in the 1920s and then wrote a book, The Bayothic and Victor. <coughs> and he made this observation around two things. Red Indian Lake at Red Indian Point. You couldn't get more of a target because it's Red Indian and Red Indian. How do you know that you know, you know that they were there? And it's interesting that this tree is the actual focus, this one right here. Why? because the limbs were chopped, and they were used as a ladder. So when they would actually go up this tree, they would go up the tree and then scout for where the caribou were crossing the lake. So that they go, and so one person would go up, oh, the caribou are coming, all right, let's go for it. So it's all about the vantage point, how you see the environment around you, the landscape around you. And this observation that Frank Speck makes uh, contributes to traditional knowledge of place and that the place that you make contains this knowledge. You see this point and you go, oh, I could use that to see other places. Oh, I could, I could use that to see other things, right? And now that I look at the environment around here, I see these large uh, granitic, or granite mounds of rock, and I go, I could stand on that seat forever. It'd be a perfect vantage point. So that kind of contributes to the understanding of the landscape. But also, the material culture is reflective of how people see the landscape. And in this example, the Bayothic had pendants. I think we all know about these pendants. They're made of bone with the red ochre put in them. And these are actually uh, attributed to the tern, the little bird. It has the shape of the bird. And it has all the anatom anatomy, all the parts of it. It's feet, it's feathers. And this is kind of a question of, how did the Bayothic see these birds? And how does it, what does the bird mean to them? The bird moves so much. The bird can tell them so much about what's going on in the environment. So what is the importance of this bird to them? And that's part of their landscape, and that's kind of an idea. So when looking at these points, they're made of certain materials like chert, like rhyolite. And the question is, well, they came from one point, and they brought them to another point made. So what is the reflection of that source to them? What does that mean to them? Right? 
So they usually come the same. That's the standard, that is. Yeah. Well, we got a standard. They come the same year, same time, every year. Same time every year. 20, 28th of May, around that date, give, give or take one or two days. 28th of May? Yeah, 28th of May. So the, the turns come the 28th of May. It's almost that date exactly. Almost that date exactly. See, that's the thing. So, so the is importance that the of them. Of, is that the case of one good turn deserves another? <laughs> <laughs> one good turn like that. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, this even, so that actually speaks. Thank you very much for bringing that up. So this brings up time, the clockwork of the environment that they're in. They see this clockwork and they, and they kind of go, oh, it's so important because the turn's migrating and stuff. So it really does talk about the landscape and, and their, their focus and their visions of these landscapes. But what I'd like to say at the end here in the conclusion, if I can very briefly, is that the Andrews Collection, Baxter Andrews Collection, contributes so beneficially to the province in such a profound way, such a small collection with so much information about so much time and so many people. Um, and the fact is, it's, it's, it's bringing one piece to an overwhelmingly large puzzle. It really is. This province, I, there's so much to be explored and there's so much to be found, but what has been found, we still are head-scratching at some cases. But, uh, you know, there, there's a bit of an issue is the lack of archaeological context. Where was it in the ground? And that would have been another piece of that puzzle that would have been added. But the problem is, is that the beaches are literally blowing away in the wind. So when you remove this uh, aspect, such as like a page to a book, as Rob Anstey had said before, uh, it kind of leaves the book incomplete. <coughs> But we, as archaeologists, need to figure out how to salvage these things before that page is completely pulled out. And salvaging is the last step that any archaeologist would like to take. But the thing is, is that archaeology is a destructive science in its own right. We dig, and once we dig, there's no going back. The context is interrupted. So it's either by our hand or the environment's. So we have to come to terms with the salvage. And my thing is, is that... Uh, if you do come across anything of archaeological importance, take notes, take photos, do anything you can to document it, call the Provincial Archaeology Office. They'd love to hear from you and see and hear what you found. Um, but that doesn't mean go out hunting for it or searching for it. But uh, I hope that this project, I hope that this presentation um, brings collectors, academics, professional, government archaeologists together to discuss at a table about the preservation and the archaeology of this, of this province. And in saying that, I'd like to just acknowledge a few people. Uh, Bernice Andrews and family who are present here. Tim Rest, who couldn't make it, uh, but helped me out quite a bit, as well as Steve Hall. Lori Temple from the Rooms Museum. Janet Davis of uh, Norton Co. Studio here. Dominic Lavers of Porter Schwa, who is currently at the Geography Department at Memorial <coughs> University. And of course, uh, my lovely assistant and my girlfriend, Jessica Lynn-Kittrick, in the back, pulling the camera. But thank you so much for coming out, and I hope you appreciate it and uh, like the presentation. Thank you very much.